I am muted. Now I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So howdy, friends of Floreds. This is me doing yet another site deep dive for Forbidden Lands. This is the third book or the third site in the core book. Uh, I've already done one for the Hollows. I've already done one for Weatherstone. Uh, this is Vale of the Dead, which is the third one in the core book outside of the Ravensland book. And there's a reason that uh, this has been the third one, uh, because I am struggling and have struggled with what I'm going to do with this adventure site. It is very different, which is not a bad thing. And I think the best way for... Uh, to show you how I attack this is to kind of take you step by step through it and we're going to go in real time. So a couple things real quick. One, and I haven't done this with the other sites, I don't think. I want to show you where I've put the Veil of the Dead inside of Raven's Land. So let's switch over to the world map real quick. So here's the world map of Raven's Land. And you'll notice over here to the west in the Ariana Forest or arena forest, that's where I have the Veil of the Dead, right inside these mountains. A couple reasons. One, it isolates it inside of the forest. And one of the big things that you get as you uh, read about the site is the isolated nature of it. I think rumors are very important for, to get people to come to this site. And this is an important feature on the map. You've got this huge forest, uh, this dark forest, and this mountain range that's just in the middle. Uh, multiple miles uh, worth. And I think this is a great place for it. So that's where I have it inside. So how do I attack this? When I see an adventure site for uh, Adventureland, the first thing I do is I go to the rumors. So let's check out for the Veil of the Dead. Let's take a look at the rumors uh, or the legend. I'm sorry. So here's the legend for Veil of the Dead. Now keep in mind that I never use these legends in game. Uh, I might take pieces of it. Uh, I like the concept of it. So there might, I might have an NPC mention something about the site that's happened in the game that I stream, but I find that as written, the, uh, legends kind of tip the hat and, or, or kind of tip the trick, uh, for these sites and kind of ruin a lot of what I think makes these sites exciting. So let's take a look at it for Veil of the Dead. And I always start here because it, it turns out that these legends are kind of great summaries to give you a sense of what this site is. So stories tell of how Zygafer, the Defiler, visited the Vale of the Dead beyond the Temple of Silence during the Alder Wars. The sorcerer's spouse, Mardia, taught him how to parley with the deceased. But when she learned how Zygafer abused the art instead of seeking wisdom... He wanted to wake the resting bones to his service. She fled from him with two of their children. Zygafer continued his work in the Vale until the Keeper of the Dead chased him away. In anger, the sorcerer drove the priests from the Temple of Silence. But before leaving the site, it is said that the holy men drowned its halls to keep them safe. All right, so that's the legend. A couple key things here. This is a place where Zygafer uh, really came before he became Zygafer Zygafer. Uh, and I think that that's important. And I think I definitely want to hint at this when the site, when I run the site, and I might even use that potentially as a way to tip off the site. So, uh, I'm expecting my players to go to the stone loom mine soon, where they're going to carve, they're going to meet, his, uh, Zygafer's wife, Martea or Matea. And I might have her talk about this. Um, I haven't decided yet. So that might be a way I lead them here. Now, after I'm done with that, I head over to the intro. Uh, by the way, I'm using Foundry. This is the official module that you can purchase uh, for Foundry, the VTT. It's my favorite VTT. And this is like 11 bucks and you get everything to be able to run Forbidden Lands. It's, it's an incredible deal. Uh, no subscription fees or anything like that, which is great. All right, so very quickly, you've got uh, a couple of different things here. One, you've got a gorge. And one of the key things about this gorge is there's only one way in and one way out. So the mountains that surround this gorge are so tall and treacherous that your players cannot make their way through it. So they won't be able, they only have one way in and one way out. I think that's significant for, about the site uh, uh, when, you, when you use it. Second thing that's important, you have got an entire section of this veil 
full of ghosts. And it's being protected by the one-eyed giant, Scrom. Now, there's a picture in the book that uh, depicts him as a Cyclops-type giant. Uh, I think reading it, uh, I don't know if that's really supposed to be a picture of him because he's obviously got two sockets and one eye is missing, which we'll uh, get into as we dig in a little bit more. And then it talks about how Zygerfer came to this valley and that's where he learned a lot of his necromancy and his consorting with demons and so on and so forth. Now, getting here, these are one of the things that I love about adventure sites is they give you a couple tricks or a couple ways potentially to get your players to the site. And again, each of these give you a little bit of insight on maybe how to run the site itself. So let's talk, look at the first one, the bounty hunters, a party of eight bounty hunters that want to capture a couple of whiners on behalf of an, of a nobleman. His child has fallen ill and he believes the sweet meat of the whiners could be the cure. The hunters might meet the adventures early on being, uh, uh, companionable and wanting to team up with them, but they are completely unreliable and unscrupulous as the only interest in their payday. Now we're going to learn here as we uh, dig into the site more that there's this kin called the whiners. It's not really described anywhere that I could find exactly what these whiners look like. There's little hints of it here and there. I'm imagining them as very small halfling sized, emaciated, uh, goblin-esque type creatures, but obviously they have a certain degree of magic around them, uh, as we're going to learn as we dig into the whiners a little bit more. So we could have bounty hunters saying, hey, we're going to go get some whiners. You want to come with us? Uh, I'm not a big fan of this one. Um, I do. It's interesting to present your players with another party with these bounty hunters. And maybe this for your for your group, this would fit perfectly, depending on the type of your group. For my group, I just don't see this as being something that would attract them to the site. Uh, they are not ones to follow bounty hunters and to hunt down another kin. The Stone Chantress and the Dwarves. The Stone Chantress or uh, or or Alda and her six dwarf henchmen want to meet the whiners in order to learn how. The small folk produces hollow rock, but dare not approach the temple because of the orcs. Both the whiners and the dwarves would benefit from working together, but the small folk are suspicious in the extreme. It's not unthinkable that the bounty hunters have integrated themselves with the dwarves to cloak their true motives. That This one's fine too. Uh, it's not one I would use either. Um, and again, this, this is just for my group. Kalmax and the Riders, a group of Galdanes from Felend, under the leadership of spear rider Kalmax, find themselves short of cash but rich in gambling debts, have got it in their heads that there is probably treasure to be found and plundered in the Vale of the Dead. They are quarreling, however, honor is important to a Galdane. To pay off their gambling debt is honorable, grave robbing is not. In addition to that, many of the horse people balk at the prospect of venturing underground since they are prone to claustrophobia. If an opportunity to earn an honest wage were to present itself, they would go for it like grasping for straw after straws, but never mind the fine print. This is the first site that I've done a deep dive on that I haven't found um, a single uh, way to get them there. Um, so this is the first time of, of all the getting there's for all the sites that not, none of these grab me and Calmax comes up later in the site, but none of these would attract me. Um, I think, I think it would have to be in my mind somewhere tied with either the legend of Zygrifer, some sort of their secrets, in the Vale of the Dead. This is where Zygerfer um, did his studies. Um, maybe taking, if you're doing Raven's Purge, uh, or even not doing Raven's Purge, you know, rumors of an artifact being left in the in the Vale of the Dead. That would have a better chance of attracting my players. Um, but yeah, again, I'm struggling with this site. Uh, but let's see if we can't figure it out together. Okay, so then we have a bunch of locations. All right, so where do I go next? Now that I've gone through that, I take a quick look at the NPC and the monsters. Again, I'm not even getting into the individual areas of the site yet because all of this gives me context. So we have Calmax, who we just heard in one of the getting there rumors. 
Cal Max of Foundor was once a proud and renowned rider in his clan. However, his foolhardy nature led him into trouble time and time again. After Aaron gambled away his family fortune uh, to the heir of the rival clan, he was exiled by his own. Uh, uh, he was exiled by his own and left with few trusted companions. To restore his honor, he needs to find silver, lots of silver. He has heard of treasures hidden in the Valley of the Dead and will do anything to get uh, his hands on it, no matter what the cost. Now, here's a potential way of getting them there is unlike kind of the how Calmax was described in the getting there section, what if players were to come across Calmax on their own and find out there is a ton of treasure and I'm headed there. Uh, potential great NPC. You can play them very, uh, several different ways uh, and have a lot of fun with them. So there's a, there's a potential getting there. Horlo, the clanless orcs have been hired by the whiners to keep enemies away. In return, they are receiving food and fermented juice. There is a whole, hey Nick, there is a whole sec, uh, section of this that um, covers what uh, who Horlo is, so we're, no need to spend a ton of time there. Then you got Zugs and the other orcs. We'll talk about the orcs in just a second as we get into the individual areas. Nasarakak, the chieftain of the whiners, is called Nasarakak. She and her people want nothing other than to live in peace and quiet inside the mountains. Like all whiners, she and her kin are terrified of tall folk and want to take them for their sweet meat. So that's interesting. The whiners eat other kin. <laughs> now, sir, wants to keep the crumb horn away from scorn at any cost. We will find out uh, more about Scrum. That's the giant as well as that crumb horn. Since his tunes cause their protective hollow rock to wither as well as being graded, uh, grading on the sensitive ears of the whiners. Okay, so then the whiners. The whiners are living in the caves near the Vale of the Dead and are typical uh, of their kin, short of stature, fleet of foot, and skeptical of strangers. And that is the most description we get on the whiners. Uh, honestly, I'm okay with that, right? So we can make the whiners, you know, whatever we want them to be. We have ghosts. Excuse me. So we're going to, we're going to, and we'll talk about uh, the ghosts. It's kind of neat how the ghosts are handled here. And I'll talk to you about how I'm going to uh, handle them. Scrome is the one eyed giant, usually peaceful and caring nature, but now he is angry and suspicious of all intruders since he has been robbed. So we learned earlier that he has been, the whiners have stolen his horn. He also harbors an instinct, an indistinct fear for his other self and asks the strangers if they bring the eye. The other places we find out that he has a brother who has the other eye. Scrum is very old, not too clever, and basically immortal. Not even the eye is uh, vulnerable since it's covered by thick glass. The giant's only weak spot is a tattoo on the top of its head put there by one who once upon a time turned him into a guardian, keeps Scorn alive, blah, blah, blah. Um, he's essentially, he takes care of the dead in this Vale of the Dead. He plays the horn, it sates uh, the dead. When our players get there, that horn has been stolen. So as you can imagine, he's not real happy as the guardian, nor are the dead. Um, now, the one thing that is interesting here is uh, to speak to Scrum, one must defeat him or return the crumb horn to him. In the latter case, he will be very grateful and bestow a gift on the adventurers, possibly an artifact, maybe the crown of Stanagist. Now, this, this is a big deal, right? If we were to say, okay, this is where Stanagist is going to be. This is where the crown is going to be. And I've hinted at the crown with my players. Um, I think they have a, a small sense of it, but it's got several of the gems already in it. And the other gems of Raven's Purge need to be put into the crown if they have any chance to go up against Zygrifer. Uh, another potential getting there. Um, this might be something that I can drop on my players while they're in the stone loom mines, where maybe this is information that the mother will give them, um, telling them that the only way to defeat my husband is to collect the gems and put them in the Stanagis crown. And I don't know. I'll have to think a little bit. Uh, maybe she said she hit it before she left. Um, yeah. Or maybe, yeah, maybe that's what I would do. I think I'd, maybe I would say, you know, and I hid it here before I came to the mines to find my daughter. We've got Harama the Glutton, which is an interesting uh, 
uh, NPC. Hermana is a shapeless, very voracious mass of tissue that reminds one of a grotesquely fat human whose limbs and features have multiplied and shifted around. There's some Forbidden Lands for you. This thing, this thing used to be the cook for Zygerfer. Zygerfer cursed him, and now he haunts the area. It's pretty, uh, pretty not nasty. All right, so now we got a sense of the our NPCs. Last but not least, we're going to look at events and then we're going to dig into the individual sites. I'll give you an idea of what kind of what my plans are. Okay, so these are events that you can trigger or could be triggered as your players are going through and uh, visiting the Vale of the Dead. So we've got the Wrath of Scrom. This is the giant. This is them coming across the giant. Um, it mentions that he will view the adventures as part of the intrusion that has disrupted the harmony of the valley from the first time they meet and be overtly hostile towards them. It's up to the adventurers to convince the giant of their good intentions. Night of the Ghosts. Something is broken in the Vale of the Dead. Ever since the disappearance of the Crumhorn, the ghosts have become increasingly agitated. They remember uh, their injustices and their old lives. There's some really cool, there's a really cool table for generating these ghosts. Uh, but this, well, I'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about the, where I would use this event. Captured. There's a terrible commotion among the whiners due to the bounty hunters managing to capture a young and careless whiner in a trap. They are celebrating in High Vale at this very moment. Nastura Crack reluctantly but desperately contacts the adventurers if they haven't proven hostile. She asks for help and tells them of the horrible fate that awaits the prisoners of the uh, if they decline. In return, the adventurers uh, in return the adventurers will become the whiner's friend, and they may even give Scrum the uh, give the horn back. So, if they are on a quest, they figure out they need to get the horn. This is a way for them to potentially get the horn back. Uh, Calmex and the Treasure. This is where they come across that bounty hunter who I think is uh, has the potential of being a great um, NPC. Um, uh, Coda says, Eric G may score him a great take on uh, Polyphemus and Baylor. I agree. that You can definitely tell that that's where the echo is, uh, Coda. I agree. Um, hey, Tales and Techniques. Thanks. Let's talk about Morm. Uh, Scrome anxiously roams the valley, shouting, Morm, Morm. It appears that one of the restless dead, and you'll see this chart um, in the Valley of the Dead, and here we can bring it up here. You can see we have a chart of these ghosts. Um, has disappeared. If the adventurers can return the runaway, it will earn them Scrome's gratitude. Now, we do not want them... We don't want them fighting. Scrum. And if they do, they'll figure out very quickly, probably once one or two of them are dead, um, that he's not one to be fought. But here's another potential non-combat solution, which is them finding out that, hey, if you can help me sate this ghost, I, we can be a friend. So Morm has managed to climb up to the plateau and gotten lost in the temple, maybe stuck in the Winer's Hollow Rock. If the grave robbers or bounty hunters realize that the giant wants the undead, they may take Morm hostage and demand something in exchange. All of that is very possible. Uh, the flooding. So they uh, very quickly, the winers have the ability to flood uh, the caves. Dance of the Unquiet. Uh, this is if Scorm gets the horn back, the dead will dance around him and basically come come back to a, a peaceful state uh, as they go. All right. Whew. Um, taking a quick break here for a second and just, and I don't know if you can see it the way I do, but I don't know. I'm I, 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 I'm struggling with the meat of this. Um, so let's go right to where things start off. So here's our entrance, right? So there's going to be this ridge valley where you're going to have huge mountains that that surround this vale. I think it's going to be critical to give them a sense that like they can only see parts of the sky, like, like walking through a streets of New York city, right. And the, the buildings are so tall that the sun only shines for a short period of time. Um, Oh, did you tales and techniques? Um, I'll be, I, I don't know. You're, you're going to hear tales that, um, of all the sites that I've come across this one, I've struggled with the most. Um, I don't know whether you did or not. I'd love to know, uh, please in the chat, let me know if you have any extra insights. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's talk about the first thing that they encounter. 
So the first thing they encounter is High Vale. So as they come to this, they're going to come to this huge precipice. You can see this then comes down to a lower valley. And understand, this is all that they can see. So initially, until they go into these caves here, they're not going to see what's happening over here, right? Where Scorm is, where uh, the dead are. They're only going to see this area here. So what do they counter in High Vale? The High Vale is going to be uh, a little bit of kind of your typical type of fantasy encounter, right? The fresh stench mars the pastoral impression of the canyon. Behind the fallen watchtower lies another one, primitively hewn from fresh debarked timber, around which filth is amassed, the remains of slaughtered animals, fruit and uh, fruit peel and offal. Crude ladder descends into the ravine. Clamoring voices can be heard from below, possibly song of some sort in the light of campfires flickers in the deep. So they are going to come across this and they're going to encounter these orcs. So this is where they have orcs. Um, and this gets into Zug uh, and the other orcs in there. They have basically have been hired by the whiners or being kept... Um, sated by the winers in order to guard this entrance. The winers do not want anybody coming into the caves nor getting to the other side to uh, where the actual veil of the dead is. So I think I would go ahead and have a couple orcs in this watchtower. Uh, though this doesn't mention it. Um, I think that uh, a nice little encounter up here could be interesting. But let's talk about what they see down below. So how the winers are keeping these orcs sated in order to guard this is basically they're brewing them ale. So smoke, smoke, hooch fumes, smell from the latrine, rise above you, the sounds of laughter, song and clatter as you descend the crude ladders. They lead down to the mountain's pass where a couple of faltering campfires impart a faint light and a couple orcs lie sleeping on the ground whilst others stumble around. So uh, we've got drunk orcs. This is going to be the way for them to get in. There's 10 of them uh, saying here that the crumb horn is here with the orcs. So we could have potentially they could find the crumb horn, having no idea why it's important or what it means. And then it looks like just a, a couple silver. More importantly, we've got here two cave entrances that's going to take us into the winers. This one, nothing indicating what it is. Maybe a potential place for a random encounter, or just because it's on the map doesn't mean you as a GM have to do anything with it, right? So you can just have the one entrance. But here's the ornate entrance that takes us in and our Temple of Silence. In stark contrast to the misery without, a beautiful temple portal opens up in the mountainside. So this is where they're gonna see the Temple of Silence. Marble steps rise along an artfully decorated stairwell towards the hall, looming in the end of the stairs. Next to the entrance stand two statues, one of which has lost its head, the other of which is holding its hand over its mouth. So this is uh, the once beautiful entrance to this Temple of Sim Silence uh, that was dedicated to the veil, uh, the veil of the dead beyond it. The priest and the staff of the temple embalmed bodies for the internal rest of the valley. Within, the work with the dead was performed in, com in complete silence. The walls to the temple hall and embalmed chamber are constructed in such a way that any and all human speech is amplified tenfold, causing even low-key conversations to echo and alert everyone in the vicinity. That's potentially very interesting. The auditory effects mean that a strong shout can stun living beings. Roll for might. If successful, all victims in the room must make an endurance roll to act that round. So we essentially everybody's got a stun uh, with yelling. I would um, probably spend some time and maybe even uh, write up before I ran this site. Something interesting um, and a little bit more in depth about this temple. Um, I would maybe ha potentially have them find artifacts. This is also a place to do potential lore dumps. Um, maybe they find a book, uh, a grimoire of some sort that has, you know, all kinds of history, some of the history in it, uh, an engraving somewhere. All right. So beyond that, we've got the embalming chamber. So this is where, uh, the embalming happened, uh, from the temple of silence. 
only contains uh, a couple treasures, but uh, could be a potential very creepy place. And uh, this could be a great fake out. So uh, having mummies wrapped up, some uh, dead, uh, embalmed, the players are going to be 100% sure that you're going to bounce some zombies their way. Uh, and you don't, uh, which can be good. But you need to describe it and sell it, right? You got to talk about how this looks, the smell, the dead flesh. Uh, did you hear something move? If it, or maybe there's a scratching noise. Like there's all kinds of ways and you could create some amazing tension. And the fact that it doesn't turn into an encounter, that they, they don't encounter uh, you know, any undead here, um, let your players know that, hey, it's not going to happen every time. And just because you enter a place that looks and feels dangerous doesn't mean it's going to be dangerous. It makes the times when it is dangerous even more amplified. All right. So down here is where the winers live. Talks about the caves where the winers are. They're put, putting together this hollow rock, which isn't really explained, but that's, again, okay. I'm fine with the fact that not everything um, is 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 is. is like splayed out, right? Not everything is in in Forbidden Lands is explained, and I'm good with that. Like we don't really know what the winers are, what uh, or uh, sort of a small description. Great, I can run with it then. Same thing here with these um uh, with these winers with the Temple of Silence. We're given enough seeds to then uh, go beyond our own. How they interact with the winers? Remember, the winers one uh, would like to eat the potentially eat the adventurers. The winers are the reason that the orcs hold the crumb horn and kept the crumb horn from uh, from him. The winers could potentially talk about the crown, could potentially reveal things about Zygafer. All different ways that this could go for the adventurers, depending on how they handle it. Uh, Tales and techniques: Veil of the Dead is set up really well to drop a critical Raven's Purge item that the party hasn't found yet. Yeah, I think the thing that's most attractive is the possibility of the Stanage's crown. One of the things I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, Tales was. I think that this would be the best getting getting there if you're running Raven's Purge is to point them that this is where Stanagist is. Uh, and one of the ideas that I thought is Matea, who was here at one point, the mother, the wife of Zygrifer, was here at one point, and she fled from here with the, with the two daughters. And then they went to the Stone Loom Mines. If they encounter her and her new form in the Stone Loom Mines... Um, I plan on, if you go look at my how to run Stone Loom Mines, you'll see that I'm going to definitely be using her to do some uh, extra lore dump when they get to the Stone Loom Mines. And she could potentially be the one that points them uh, this way. Uh, so, several different ways this winer's encounter can go. They could end up being a battle. They could end up being friends. They could end up being quest givers. Uh, so, several different ways that this can go. Now we get some of the craziness. So we now exit the winer's area where they're living in this Temple of Silence, and we get into the actual veil itself. Nice little picture of Scorn here. God, I love this art. And you see the ghosts. Little pictures of the ghosts. The, uh, the art in this book is just incredible. Oh, I missed a spot up here. Mountain crevice. Uh, tremors in the mountain have led to a, a wide crevice appearing in the left wall of the temple hall. The passage leads upwards, and you can see daylight in its farthest end. This crevice leads all the way to the Valley of the Dead, where it ends in a plateau some four meters above the floor of the valley. One can climb down, but cannot climb up again without the aid of rope or helping hand. This is the plateau that's talked about where potentially the bounty hunters could have a captive, whether it be you know the whiner or one of the ghosts or whatever. All right, so where do we want to start? Let's go over here and let's look at the general veil of the dead. Um, this is one of the more important descriptions, I think, uh, as you look at this adventure site. Protected by high mountain walls, a beautiful verdant valley opens up before you. A mournful and restrained sense of waiting rests within the exuberance of this place, where the tall cypresses seem to reach for the sky longing to leave aging tombstones rise from the soil where the fog creeps while larger slabs seal larger slabs seal crypts in the mountains you can see the remains of buildings and overgrown orchards spilling over and out of their enclosures here and there semi-transparent humanoid forms move in silence while others stand still with empty stares 
Um, boy, I would not use this box tax, but it's inspiring. I'm imagining, especially coming from the loudness of the, of the silence, I think I would start with really describing this as a huge graveyard. And not only a graveyard because of the tombstones, but I am also think it's very interesting to talk about, essentially there used to be an entire town or city or village here at one point, and you can see the ruins of it all over the place. I like the idea of the fog uh, kind of covering the ground, obscuring uh, parts of the valley itself. I don't think when they first come into the valley that I would reveal the dead, the way it does here in the box tax. I think that I would, depending on what time of day it is, is it day or night, then um, the idea that at some point the dead appear and rise. And, you know, what if they're camping here uh, when that happens? I think you, I, I think just describing the text when they walk into the valley uh, is not what I would do. Um, I, I don't think I would describe this as, hey, here's the valley dead, and there's just ghosts walking all the way around. I just... Um, I don't know. That doesn't strike me. I think I would keep those ghosts in my back pocket for a potentially very dramatic uh, reveal. So uh, here we've got some ghosts that you can have them encounter. I think that that is very interesting to have maybe the maybe one ghost that they encounter at first, and not having them just some be some faceless ghost, right? Have it be somebody that actually matters. Um, that could all happen right here. All right. Other points of interest. Down here, we've got the graves. Here, it talks about the ghosts. And there's a, um, if we click on the ghosts, you can see we've got a lineup for it. Let's see, does it have? Yeah. So they're monsters. They've got some great attacks on them. Here we've got the graves more here. And then here we've got Harma's kitchen. This is where we encounter Harma the glutton. It is the only standing building there. It is where Zygerfer did his studies and where he stayed. And Har uh, Harama, uh, I keep calling Harma, Harama uh, took care of him and was a cook and was rewarded by being turned into something nasty. Uh, it's got this Harma's soup stone. Uh, treasure in here. And if you read it, you, you come to find out all it does is, um, I think basically, let's see if it describes it here. Uh, I think it actually d d describes it in his note here. I would, and, and I'll tell you right now that I, I'm going to change this stone. I like the idea of the stone, a soup stone. Um, so, Harma is a potential way for them to find out about Squirm's tattoo, which is the vulnerability. Where I'm trying to remember where I read where it talks about the stone. And essentially what the stone does is make you more powerful against Harama. If you like drink soup from it, I don't know. Uh, I think it could be more interesting as um, maybe something that, you know, classic artifact gives and takes away. Right. So you could say, you know, if you make a meal with this with a stone, maybe you get uh, plus one might and minus one empathy. Uh, that would make sense for uh, Harama and uh, kind of where he is now. Tail says, uh, I love the way that Forbidden Lands adventure sites are written. Me too. I feel like they give the GMs just enough inspiration, but uh, not so much as a feel to the constraints. Yeah, and Tales, I don't know if you've read um, uh, any of their other stuff, uh, Tales from the Loop, as well as as uh, Alien. But the, this is a consistent thing that they do: is they 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 basically they say, "Hey, here's what's going on here, and." Here's the major players. Here's a couple events that might happen. Now take your agents of chaos, your players, and come play. The stories that came out of just the hollows with my groups was amazing. And I've run the hollows for two different groups and it was completely different. And if this, if the hollows was a module with, with a set storyline and a series of events, even a plot point campaign, I, we wouldn't have experienced what we've experienced allowing 
the players really to be the agents of change in each one of these locations and allowing whatever stories or narratives to emerge from play itself. So here they can fight Harama. Haram. Haram. I cannot pronounce that name to save my life. That's basically it, right? Um, so in thinking through this, we've got, I guess, a couple major, uh, I agree, Coda. Um, I agree. They have cracked the code on, a, on how to present um, adventures. We've got a couple potential interesting things, right? So we've got the horn, we've got the giant. We, um, you know, at this point, maybe the players have never encountered a giant having him come out of maybe this cave to the North and, uh, you know, maybe the, you know, could really be a, a powerful moment. Right. Um, and now they're in this Valley and where are they going to hide? And then the ghosts come out, there's all kinds of threats. I, um, this could easily be a TPK location, right? This is way more of these ghosts. If these ghosts turn on the players and all these ghosts in any way attack these players, multiple ones, they're done. It's over. So here's my tips. One, I would not make this a pure combat encounter. You can let that happen with the orcs if you want, though I think that the orcs, orcs present a really nice stealth opportunity um, as well. I think it might be interesting if they don't do a whole lot of exploring here, maybe they sneak through and don't really encounter and deal with the orcs. Then they find out about the horn and got to go back to go get the horn. Presenting them an opportunity to interact with the giant and for the giant to explain why the dead are angry or why the dead are sad. And, and, and that's another thing I was thinking about too, is maybe not making the dead angry, but making this a solemn place. And yes, if they anger these ghosts, these ghosts could attack. But what if this is, this is a place of mourning, a place of sadness. And I don't know, there's a couple different ways to attack it. Um, let me know in the comments uh, what, what you got. Anybody here, any GMs here that have run this, I would love to hear how you've run it. I still have a lot of digesting to do on the site. Um, it is, I think, here's what I can say. There's a very good chance that even though I can't wrap my head around this and, and really, when I say wrap my head around this, when I read adventure sites, I try to get um, some solid ideas of what my approach is going to be. I don't try to spend too much time uh, dis making hard decisions because I, I want to follow my players in the process. This It's possible that this site could be amazing following the players. There's all kinds of different ways and different branches and choices that the players can make as they're going through this, starting with, you know, the, the encounter here with the orcs. And maybe, you know, they befriend the orcs or, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities, um, there. Um, what happens with the whiners? There's all kinds of possibilities of what could happen with these whiners and how they interact with the whiners. You could make the whiners super creepy, right? In these closed caves and these, in the ruins of this temple and, you know, make them climbing walls and, and skittering around and, uh, you know, very, very scary, very creepy. Staying silent is very, very difficult. You could um, have echoes of wailing from the ghosts echoing through the halls. Maybe that draws them over to the valley. Um, I don't know. It, like I said, it's possible that this could be an amazing site to follow the players because of the different branches are. My recommendation is be nimble with it. Um I think the rewards here uh, are potentially high uh, with Stanagist as well as the potential lore dumps about Zygerfer itself, especially early Zygerfer. Uh, Sidewinder, the party has some dealings with some Galdanes in the past, correct? Any tie-ins with the bounty hunters just spitballing with limited memory of events? Uh, yeah, um, you know our group has encountered the Galdanes, and yeah, I could potentially leverage that a little bit. I think that... I'm not crazy about that lead in though, uh, Sidewinder, I gotta tell you. Um, and, 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 and understand I'm biased because of how my players are, are, are playing Forbidden Lands. Now, if your players are treasure hunters 
and they are out in the forbidden lands to get rich than encountering these bounty hunters and these bounty hunters saying, hey, there's a shipload of gold and treasure in this place. You want to come with us? And then have them, you know, potentially, betray, excuse me, betray them. There's all kinds of possibilities there. I'm just saying for me, it wouldn't work with the party that I'm running right now. That wouldn't attract them. But I do think that the bounty hunter Calyx being found in the temple, messing with things, either messing with Scorn, with that ghost encounter, having him kidnap the ghost or having him kidnapping one of the liners. Um, there's some really good possibilities there. Um, him professing to have some secrets and talking the players into it. I mean, you could really make him an interesting NPC um, and an interesting potential encounter. Um, there as well. All right, guys, um, that's, <laughs> I feel like this is the worst of all of the deep dives I've done because I, I, I don't have a ton of tips other than I think, um, you have to follow your players on this. You're going to have to see how your players chew up the site and be ready, be ready for the orcs to be friends or foes, the whiners to be friends or foes. Be flexible, I think, in the valley um, with how you deal with the dead and how you deal with the encounter with Scorn. Um, for me, just having them fight this giant and and likely be taken down by that, that's not very interesting to me, nor is it interesting to me for them to be attacked by, you know, 15, 20 ghosts and, you know, being taken out as well. Uh, Stanagist, I think, is the MacGuffin that could potentially draw them in here. And... I think that, you know, either the orcs or the whiners can potentially tip off to your players about the giant um, and that he's angry. Uh, something was stolen from him. Um, he rightfully has something missing. He's a troublemaker. It depends on who's, you know, doing the talking. I don't know. There's all kinds of possibilities here. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, and do another video on this either after I've run it or after I've digested a little bit more. But uh, I hope this has been helpful for you. And believe it or not, it's been helpful for me. I think I have a better grasp of this site now than I did before going through it step by step with it. My approach is always the same on these. If you want to see us playing Forbidden Lands, uh, as of the time of this recording, we are 25 episodes in. It is one of the more popular plays on the channel. We are having so much fun with this system. If you have not run this game, I definitely recommend that you run this game. Um, it is my now favorite fantasy system uh, and my favorite fantasy setting. Uh, Tails, you say, uh, I am interested to see how your group handles encountering a large number of restless dead again. The last time they would have seen anything close to this many was in the hollows. However, this area offers a whole new perspective on the dead. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, that's interesting, Tails, because... You could do an, an interesting tie-in with the bells, right? We could have the bells from the hollows. Maybe this is where that idea comes from, the soothing of the sound. Uh, yeah, I think tying it with the hollows is not a, not a terrible idea, uh, Tails. I need to think about that a little bit more. But it potentially could be a very different encounter with the dead, uh, to your point. Um, the dead are not nearly as scary in the hollows as they potentially could be here. Um, and, uh, having them as, as real threats, uh, potentially could be the way to go and be prepared for your players to say, peace, I'm out. Especially if you're not, um, uh, putting Stanagist in here and making that, um, I have to put in there and no dwarves to sacrifice. <laughs> That's right. Unlike stone loom mines, right? Okay. Thanks again. If you want to see the, the other deep dives um, where I talk a little bit more in depth with some of the sites that I've got a much better grip on and sites that I've actually run, make sure you check it out on the channel. Uh, there's a whole series of these. This is the fifth site uh, that I've done with it. Uh, really appreciate it. I love seeing everybody in the chat. Um, so Sidewinder, Tails, it was great talking to me. Coda, always great to see you. Um, I saw Nick Westbrook uh, come in. So everybody take care. Cheers. Howdy friends, 
Thank you for watching. All our content is archived and organized in playlists on the Third Floor Wars YouTube channel. Check it out. And if you could like, follow, subscribe, and even set your notifications to this channel on YouTube and Twitch, we'd appreciate it and it'll make sure that you catch all of our content. I talk with creators, designers, and experts across the gaming landscape in every episode of our podcast, Tabletop Talk. Open up your favorite podcatcher and search for Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. Support your creators. They make the content you love, and it's your support that makes it happen. If you want to help us, go to Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com, and you can help us for as little as a dollar a month. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Take care.